Dr. Rotimi Luco. Um, Dr. Luco, if you want to join us on screen, that would be absolutely wonderful. Dr. Luco is the is a professor in the Department of Human Nutritional Sciences at the University of Manitoba. His research areas include looking at the production of bioactive peptides, um, particularly through enzymatic hydrolysis of food proteins. And he has a special interest in antihypertensive proteins. So with that, Dr. Aluko, let's bring you on screen. And there you are. If you wanna go ahead, Dr. Aluko, and um, pull that PowerPoint slide deck out all the way. We'll turn the floor over to you and hear more about cod and salmon protein. So. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yep, we can see your screen. If you wanna go ahead and make it full size, that would be great in slideshow okay. view. Hi, what now? Perfect, the floor okay. is all yours. All right, thanks so much, uh, Wendelin. And uh, uh, before I start, let me just, uh, you know, thank uh, Dr. Tom Gill uh, for, you know, the wonderful introduction to this uh, uh, project. And uh, also thank him for uh, involving me uh, in this project uh, because uh, prior to Dr. Gill's uh, interaction with me, uh, I believe about uh, close to 10 years ago, uh, you know, I, I worked primarily on plant proteins. You know, I, I never worked on uh, animal proteins. And so we're both members of the Advanced Food and Materials Network, AFMNet. And so, you know, we, you know, we, when Dr. Gill approached me in terms of a collaboration uh, for peptide separation uh, fractionation. Uh, it was really very exciting, and I'm glad that uh, eventually it worked out very well. I believe we were able to publish four papers uh, from our collaboration, which is really very, very uh, fantastic. Anyway, so I'm going to look at the antihypertensive side of uh, these products. Like somebody already, uh, question, you know, like a question already had was whether these peptides also have blood pressure reducing effect. And I think the reason why this is very important, why we looked at this, uh, is the fact that uh, we know that uh, diabetes, especially type two diabetes, uh, can actually, uh, type two diabetes can actually, uh, excuse me, I'm getting some, messages here okay all right since my screen has disappeared can you still see my screen yep we can still absolutely okay. see all right um good so the reason why this is very important is because of the fact that our type 2 diabetes is usually associated also with other uh, symptoms which can be very, very devastating. Uh, one of them, of course, is hypertension. And the fact that people with diabetes could also suffer from excessive high blood pressure. Uh, therefore, if you have uh, you know, a therapeutic product uh, that not only reduces blood glucose, but can also help reduce blood pressure, then, you know, it could really be, you know, what you can call, you know, a one-two punch against the disease. So this is why what piqued my interest uh, in this work. And so uh, we decided to look at the uh, blood pressure uh, effect. So this is the brief outline of the presentation. I'll just give you one slide about the background information. Uh, protein hydrolysis has already been talked about by Dr. Gill. And then I'll look at peptide fractionation and the two types of tests we conducted. 
So we know that hypertension is believed to be instrumental to the high mobility and mortality rates experienced among adults around the world. And again, this is because of the fact that uh, can be associated with other things like this. It's a very, very unique condition that adds, you know, a lot of attention. It affects about 15 to 20% of all adults globally, uh, and its treatment reduces the risk of cardiovascular diseases such as arteriosclerosis, stroke, renal failure, myocardial infarction, and of course, peripheral vascular disease, which is very, very common in people that have type 2 diabetes. Now, a proven strategy for combating hypertension and cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular related diseases, involve the use of synthetic drugs, which we all know they're called ACE inhibitors or renin inhibitors. And these drugs are designed to modulate uh, the renin angiotensin system uh, because this system is what really regulates our blood pressure. Uh, in the renin angiotensin system, we have two key enzymes that basically play important role in blood pressure regulation. And these two enzymes are renin and angiotensin 1 converting enzyme. And so these two enzymes, right from time, have been targets of uh, the pharmaceutical you know, you know, uh, agents in terms of uh, development of blood pressure uh, you know, uh, regulating agents. And so you see that a lot of the drugs uh, are either you know, ACE inhibitors, or the renin inhibitors. However, in this work, we explored the potential use of hydrolyzed cod and salmon muscle proteins as antihypertensive agents, but also through their ability to inhibit activities of ACE and renin. So they work similarly to drugs, even though they are not drugs, but hopefully they can reduce blood pressure to levels that can actually, you know, uh, you know, modulate, you know, these types of diseases, especially hypertension and type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> so in terms of the experimental approach, uh, what we did when Tom came to my lab, uh, he already produced the uh, protein hydrolysate from cod and salmon. So what we were engaged with was to separate uh, these two uh, you know, protein hydrolysates as a means of enhancing the properties of these two hydrolyses. Because we know that when you have a hydrolysate, you, there's a potential to enhance activity of these hydrolyses if you separate the peptides. Because if you separate them, then you might be able to separate or to, in, to remove the non-active peptides from the active peptides. <clears throat> uh, so like I said, <clears throat> the core protein hydrolyzing and salmon protein hydrolyzing production uh, methods were as described by Dr. Gill's presentation. Uh, and so uh, each of these uh, hydrolyzes was dissolved in distilled water, just typical HPLC protocol uh, and then uh, we, we then separated them on a semi-preparative HPLC column. Uh, we separated them into basically four fractions. Uh, so the fractions were eluted from the column at a flow rate of 10 mils per minute using a linear gradient of uh, 0 to 100% methanol. And again, one of the things I learned from this, uh, uh, from this work with Tom was that prior to Tom coming to my lab, uh, we had actually almost always used acetonitrile for our peptide elution, you know? But then we found out that when Tom came and we tried the acetonitrile, the acetonitrile seemed to precipitate the cod and salmon peptides. So they were not very, very suitable. And that is when we tried methanol, and methanol worked perfectly in allow us to have a soluble uh, sample that we can run through the HPLC column. Uh, the peptide elution was monitored at 220 nanometers 
uh, and then the elements were collected with an automated uh, fraction collector, and then they were pulled into four fractions uh, for the sake of practicality. So we had fraction CF1 to 4 for cod, and then we had fractions SF1 to 4 for the salmon. <clears throat> The pulled fractions were dissolventized, basically to remove the methanol uh, and in the rotary evaporator. And then the aqueous residues were freeze dried and stored frozen at minus 20 degrees Celsius uh, until required for further analysis. So for the in vitro assays, <coughs> we, did it, we did the ACE and uh, Renin assays, you know, uh, using standard methods to test the ability of these fractions compared with the hydrolyzate, whether these fractions work better as ACE and renin inhibitors, okay, compared to the uh, original hydrolyzate. So again, standard uh, protocols were used for the uh, renin and ACE assays. But we also looked at the IC50 values at different peptide concentrations. And we did, uh, we, we thought that we sort of uh, have an idea of how these peptides actually inhibit the enzymes. You know, it's just some basic uh, food chemistry, uh, looking at kinetics of enzyme inhibition uh, by uh, plotting the line rubber uh, plot. <clears throat> uh, for the in vivo test, uh, we, uh, we found out that from the in vitro test, uh, the most active HPLC fractions were the third fractions, CF3 and SF3. Okay, in comparison to the original hydrolysates, they were really very, very active. And so the these two fractions uh, from cod, CF3, and from salmon, the SF3, were then compared with the original hydrolysates. Uh, in terms of the ability to reduce blood pressure after oral administration to spontaneously hypertensive rats. Of course, from the name, we know that these rats develop hypertension spontaneously as they grow. And so they're a very, very good model to look at uh, the ability of agents to reduce blood pressure in human beings because the mechanism behind the hypertension in these rats is very, very similar to the mechanism in uh, human beings. <clears throat> so the hydrolyzers were not very active. So again, I'm just giving you a summary because we did several concentration tests. The hydrolyzate and the, uh, the hydrolyzate, the cod and the salmon, they were not very, very active uh, until we reached about 200 milligrams per kilogram rat body weight. Uh, that is when we, when we uh, you know, sort of obtain what we can call reasonable activity. In contrast, the fractionated peptides, the CF3 and SF3, were pretty active. Okay, even at 30 milligrams uh, per kilogram, uh, we were able to observe significant decreases in blood pressure. And of course, we use catoprel, the antihypertensive drug, as a positive control to make sure that our system is working properly. So following oral administration of these agents, the systolic blood pressure of the rats were measured at two hour intervals for about eight hours. And then finally, after 24 hours, just to see whether these peptides provide long-term benefit in terms of blood pressure reduction. So quickly looking at the results. <clears throat> So in terms of the in vitro assay for the cod, uh, again, you can see uh, the uh, various uh, fractions uh, were able to inhibit ACE. Uh, CF1, uh, the first fraction was less you know, effective, but what we found was that uh, apart from CF3 and 4, uh, CF1 and 2 actually were not as effective as the original hydrolysate. Uh, similar, similar results were obtained for the salmon. It seems as if as you, you know, as, as you collect the fractions, uh, the fractions that elute later on uh, seem to have similar uh, uh, activity 
as the original hydrolysis. But then when we look at renin, we saw a different, uh, you know, activity in terms of ability of these uh, products to inhibit renin activity. So again, you can see here that the third fraction CF3 uh, was the most active uh, in terms of inhibition of renin activity, much more active than the original hydrolysate. Same thing with the salmon, okay, the SF3 was most active. And so that is why we choose, like I said, we choose SF3 because the third fraction based on this renin activity, uh, we know that renin activity is very, very important. And so based on renin activity, we choose the SF3 uh, to use for the rat experiments because you can see that the, really the uh, SF1 or CF1 and 2 were not very, very active. So like I said, we looked at the IC50 values to just to give us an idea of how much peptide you need to reduce the activity of the enzyme by 50%. And so you can see here uh, for <clears throat> the cord, you can see that uh, usually it's much easier to inhibit, uh, you know, uh, uh, ACE than renin. But what is very, very interesting here, you can see here, actually, let me use my laser here. So what you can see here is that for the renin activity, I mean, for the renin activity, yeah, you can see that the IC50 value was much lower for the CF3, the HPLC fraction compared uh, to the hydrolysis. And again, for IC50, the lower the value, the more active that compound. So really, we can see here that the, uh, the, the cord fraction three, uh, was a much more active renin inhibitor uh, compared to the uh, cord protein hydrolysis. Uh, similar values uh, were also obtained for the salmon. So again, just showing that it really, for both the cord and the salmon, really we didn't see much differences in terms of the activities. And then we look at kinetics of ACE inhibition, how these peptides inhibit ACE, so this is the hydrolysate. Okay, you can see that uh, in terms of the kinetics, usually because these lines don't intersect on the X axis, which means that the inhibition of, uh, this, of, of this enzyme by this peptide is true what we call uncompetitive inhibition, which means that these peptides, they bind to the enzyme substrate complex uh, to give you an effect a similar effect was also seen uh, for the salmon protein hydrolysate. And then for the ACE inhibition by this fraction, the same thing we can see that for the cod and both the salmon, uh, ACE was inhibited in an uncompetitive manner, which means that again, both the peptides uh, and the hydrolysis, they bind uh, to the enzyme substrate complex uh, to reduce uh, the catalytic activity of ACE. But you see that in the case of renin is different. You can see in the case of renin, uh, the, <clears throat> the lines intersect at the X axis, which means that this is a non-competitive inhibition, which simply means that these uh, peptides bind to the renin protein outside the uh, active comp, I mean the active site of the enzyme. Same thing was obtained for salmon. And for the HPLC fraction, also the same activity. Okay, so we can see that uh, for uh, ACE inhibition, the, 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 the peptides they bind to the enzyme substrate complex. For renin, the peptides were bound to positions outside the active site of the enzyme. And so, and then we, like I said, this is the uh, results for the blood pressure reducing effect in spontaneously hypertensive rats. And I think what is most important to note here is the fact that uh, both the hydrolysate, which is the red, okay, for cod, and the purple for, for salmon, we had mm, little, inc little effect, okay, a uh, small decrease in blood pressure after two hours, okay? 
But of course, this effect decreased with time, which is understandable because these are peptides, and peptides get broken down very quickly uh, within uh, the blood and within the muscles. Okay, but when you compare them uh, to the uh, the HPLC fractions, which is CF3 and SF3, the CF3 is black and the SF3 is green, you can see really uh, about more, more than twice, or almost twice, uh, the decrease in blood pressure after two hours, okay, for the HPLC fractions, telling us that the HPLC fractions, uh, the activity reflect what we saw in vitro, the fact that the HPLC fractions are better antihypertensive agents than the original hydrolyzers. But again, just like the hydrolyzer, you can see with time, uh, the effect also decreased, but still better than the hydrolyzer. Even up to 24 hours, you can see there was still some effect which was better than the hydrolysis. okay? So we now can confirm that the HPLC fractions, the fractionation actually enhanced the antihypertensive effect uh, of this peptide. And we compare them to uh, captopril, of course, uh, the drug, and you can see uh, captopril uh, also reduce uh, blood pressure there, but of course, at a lower concentration of 10 milligrams. So to conclude very briefly, so we can say that cod and salmon protein hydrolysates, they have similar effects in terms of enzyme inhibition and blood pressure reduction. But we know that HPLC separation of the peptides resulted in fractions that had stronger, both in vitro actually for redding inhibition and in vivo in terms of blood pressure reduction. The HPLC fractions had stronger effects than the original hydrolysates. Uh, the hydrolysates inhibited ACE through uncompetitive means, which means that they bind to the enzyme substrate complex, but the inhibition for the RNA was different. So for the RNA, the, ENZ, the RNA was inhibited uh, in a, so this should not be no, this should not be competition with non-competitive, sorry, that's an error there. The inhibition was non-competitive, which suggests that the peptides were bound to the enzyme, to the to the were bound outside the enzyme active complex. Uh, there's an error there, I forgot to fix it. But again, for the renin, it was a non-competitive inhibition, which means that the peptides were bound, okay, to uh, to sites outside the enzyme active site. <clears throat> so oral administration to the rats confirmed stronger antihypertensive potency of the HPLC fractions when compared to the original hydrolysis. So when we did a calculation based on the conversion uh, equation to convert animal dose to human dose, uh, a 60 kilogram person will require 300 milligrams of the HPLC fractions on a daily basis uh, to see the type of effect we have shown here. Whereas if it is the hydrolysate, the person will need to take close to two grams of the hydrolysate on a daily basis. So again, uh, <clears throat> fractionation seems to make it more potent. But again, the question always is, how you balance economics, right? Okay, because there's also cost involved in HPLC fractionation. So does that cost, okay, get covered by the stronger reduction? Okay, or we can just use the hydrolyzer, but for the hydrolyzer, we need larger amounts of intake, up to two grams on a daily basis, okay? So just to acknowledge, like, like I said again, Dr. Gill, uh, is the originator of this project, and without him, uh, you know, all this would not have been possible. And these were the trainees that actually worked on the project uh, back back in those days. Uh, my PhD students, uh, the three of them, and then Dr. Hassan, who was a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Tom Gill, and of course, uh, funding, like Dr. Gill said, from INSAC Strategic Grant but also in part from Inside Discovery Grant. Okay, so thank you. And I believe that is the end of my presentation. So over to you, Wendelin. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Aluko. Really fascinating work, and it was a nice dovetail going in from um, Dr. Gill's talk in, into your talk. Got a couple questions that have come in, and the the first one, you know, I guess has to do more with the early stage, I'll call it um, testing component. And it's really, have you considered using a tissue on a chip as an approach to study the effects of fractional peptides in different human organs, right? Whether it, whether it's, you know, the, the, the um, organ on a chip to, to look at kidneys, right? Or pancreas or liver. No, unfortunately, that, that's not something we do here. Uh, we haven't okay. uh, we haven't done that. Uh, we tend to concentrate, uh, you know, more of either cell culture, like Dr. Gill said, or we use the whole animal. You know, we don't have right. the ability for an organ on a, you know, yes. Unfortunately, we, we don't have that setup. Yeah, but it would be interesting to, to look at that. Of course, it, I mean, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. It's really fun. yeah. Um, so other question um, talks a bit about your data, right? And the data on the um, SHR rats showed a reduction in systolic bl blood pressure. Um, what about the diastolic blood, blood pressure? Was it a similar type effect or... Was it yes, not yes, uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Unfortunately, what happened was that uh, you know, for some reason, at the time we were doing this work, for some reason, uh, we could not. The machine would not give us a reliable reading for the diastolic blood pressure, you know, and so we didn't want to just take any numbers and you know, which we know might be wrong. So we didn't, you know, use the data from the diastolic blood pressure because we felt like i said the machine was just not uh, giving us reliable information uh but we have done other work you know uh, where we have seen that there were also reductions in diastolic blood pressure and yeah we have reported this also in uh, various publications uh where we saw both uh, reductions in systolic and diastolic okay but it's just unfortunate, we are not sure what happened when we were doing this experiment. We are just getting very weird diastolic blood pressure readings, and I decided that uh, we were not going to use them. Yeah. You know, as, as somebody who did spend part of their early research career, um, I completely understand how that happens sometimes. And you sit there and go, you know what? Can't get there. Just can't get there. No confidence. So good for you in, in making the decision that 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 um, you didn't have the confidence right coming out on that data. Um, so um, last question I wanted to to ask is you talked a bit about um, the I'll call it the, the potency difference right between once you clean it up by HPLC right versus the more messy hydrosylate um, mixture um, is there a potential to do other types of chromatography to kind of go somewhere kind of in between just the gamish that is that that was our technical term in grad school it was this gamish of um, hydrosylate versus um you know running it through that purified form through hplc yeah you know um i, I don't think so you know i mean okay. um yeah I mean, you could use uh you know other column chromatography methods you know but it's still chromatography right you know yep. um there's just no you know because the, the sample we are working with is already pass through ultrafiltration membrane. So it's, a, it's the less than 1,000 Dalton peptides. So they're very small right. peptides. So you cannot talk of additional ultrafiltration. You know, it's not going to work. Uh, so yeah, so in this case, that was basically the only option we have in terms of something that is feasible, 
you know, that could be done, you know. And I think one of the reasons why we did it was that it was a prelude to uh, Dr. Gill being able to eventually try and see whether they can look at the peptide sequences, you know, because the more you fractionate them, then the less amount of peptides in a fraction, and then you can do all that fractionation and be able to look at the peptide sequences, which, uh, you know, John is going to talk about uh, very soon.